I've been in the criminal game over 25 years, locked up for 18 of those, we were just in and out of prison. Yet I had this huge reputation as a money maker and someone who'd done all these high end sort of um, different types of crime to make a lot of money in a short period of time. Run away from home at 12 years of age, get out onto the streets, get into survival mode, start to get into crime, start in petty crimes, obviously doing stuff just to survive. Food over the food, roof over the head, into a life of bank robberies. So um, by the end of that, I'd served 18 years of jail. Um, my last sentence, 2010, I served seven years down in Melbourne in maximum security prisons down there, Bowen and so forth. From Sydney, right? Where, where are you originally from? Yeah, good old Redfern, the block. For those that don't know, I sort of skipped that part. The block was one of Australia's most notorious streets. To give you context to that, drugs, crime, going to jail, boys home at that time, point in time was a badge of honour for us. There was no fear in going to any of those. Everyone was there. Um, domestic violence, you name it, it was in our community, right? And we just accepted it all as normal behaviours. That street had its reputation because, you know, police car would drive down, brick would get thrown, they'd jump out, the boys would try and jump the police officers who had guns, they'd then burn the police car and, you know, more police would show up and now running riots you know, ensues from that. And, yeah, you'd meet at the top of Redfern and go out and rob a bank. But how were you able to actually, yeah, have a different experience and and um, think that life could be different for you? you Boom, what is crackalackin' Real Drug Talk podcast listeners? Um, welcome to another episode of Real Drug Talk. My name's Jack Nangle, and on this show, we talk about all things drugs, alcohol, addiction, addiction recovery, and anything else interesting in the space. So quick announcement, if uh, you are tuning in on Spotify, this is the first ever video podcast that we have loaded up to Spotify, and there's going to be plenty more to come, uh, which we're really excited about, while pretty much every single podcast that we put out from now on Spotify will have that video recorded element to it. So we're very excited about that. So if you're listening anywhere, I would say Spotify is the optimal. Um, and then our podcast episodes will be closely followed with them being uploaded onto YouTube along with some other original video content. So we're very excited about that. And we have a really cool first opening episode to be watched as a video uh, podcast on um, Spotify with Jeffrey Morgan. Um, it was a great chat. So I say in the podcast, um, it's, it's kind of funny. It's, it's one of the first, oh, not the first, but it's, it's one of the few experiences that I've had on the podcast where I've had somebody on that I actually follow <laughs> and that gets me all pumped up and excited about life. Um, yeah, Jeffrey Morgan's one of these people. He's, he's message. Uh, I guess the life that he's lived and the places he's come from is really full on intense and hectic. Um, and yeah, I find it very inspiring um, to hear how he's worked through that, um, changed his life and created a different story and outcome for himself and his family. It's really cool. So um, I hope you enjoy the show today. Um, as always, this show is brought to you by Connection Based Living. Um, that's our outpatient coaching uh, program where we teach people how to beat addictive patterns without going to rehab. So if you've ever wanted to get some help um, and wanted to change things up, but you don't connect with the traditional approach, go to the description below, click on the links, um, book in a call. We'll see how we can help. Um, you know, have a chat to you, talk to you about the next best moves that you can make. If we can help, awesome. If we can't, we'll point in the right direction. Um, but again, we're finding that so many people are after this sort of service. Um, they want some help. They need the intensity of help, but they don't want to physically go and check into a facility and they want an updated approach and philosophy from coming at it. So that's connection based living. That's what we do. Um, and there's a few other things that we'll update on, but we're, we're not going to talk about it all now because um, we want to jump into the show and just get the video podcast rolling. Um, so we'd love any feedback. I think you can leave like comments and posts um, on Spotify uh, now as you go along. We, we still like Apple Podcasts, but we I, I think we really want to make Spotify the place where people come to consume the podcast because there is the different levels of engagement that you can interact with now. Um, and it'll be good feedback for us uh, to improve our shows, improve our podcasts, 
hear from our listeners um, and just give people the best experience. So as always, thanks so much for listening and supporting us. It's been really cool over the last couple of years to have, you know, thousands upon thousands of downloads and heaps of people listening to our show. It's really cool. Um, we're looking forward to the next iteration, which is coming thick and strong. Um, so we're excited to tell you all about that. But for now, let's jump into the first video version of the podcast on Spotify and enjoy everybody. Peace. Boom. Welcome everybody to another episode of Real Drug Talk. Uh, on a on a real like um, personal level, I'm uh, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't told Jeffrey this yet. Uh, but on a personal level, I've been so excited because I actually am like a, uh, I don't know, like a, like a genuine fan of Jeffrey's content. Like I tune into That's it funny. on a, on a, on a daily slash weekly basis when I'm looking at Instagram. And I said to him, I, I don't, I hope you don't take offense. I don't, he, I, I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but he's a motivational motherfucker. This guy, like he, his videos pop up on my feed, and I get. Um, I get excited about life and to do cool stuff in the day and things like that. So um, really interesting, uh, big story, really, full on. So I'm excited to hear a lot about that as well. But how are you, mate? I'm, I'm blessed and, mate, I've got to say thank you. And that's, you know, the point of podcasts and you should even be, um, what's the word, grateful, blessed you're in a space to be able to share knowledge to the world and that's all I did and ever did and had intentions of. Um, it's something my grandmother taught me, always share the knowledge that you carry. Aboriginal people carry a message stick and that message stick has knowledge on that that allows you to level up in life and I suppose, you know, that's what you make people feel on the end of that conversation. I appreciate your kind words, brother. It means a lot, but um, I'm just another person delivering that knowledge to the world and from that, you know, as you said, <laughs> the motivation behind that and we're going to get into that, no doubt, throughout the podcast, but um, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome, mate. Awesome. So where we might start, because um, we were talking about this um, uh, just just before we hit record, I actually said, fuck, I've got to hit record. This is, this is good stuff. Um, <laughs> ob- obviously, this podcast is centered around um, drugs, alcohol, addiction. Um, and uh, you know, I'll I'll let you explain a little bit and just give us like the background of your life. Um, but from my understanding, you know, maybe per se you didn't have like an addiction to drugs, but it sounds like life was fucking crazy. You're around that stuff, and yeah, there was there was addictions or escapism behavior going on in lots of other areas of your life. Um, and you have such a great uh, story of change, which is you know really what. The other part of this podcast is about is about how people turn their lives around and the techniques and stuff mm-hmm. they use. So, do you want to try? Because uh, it's a big story, I know. But do you want to try and give us the three minute snapshot of of <laughs> you and and where you started, where you where you what what happened, and and how it's ended up now? Yeah, too easy. Run away from home at twelve years of age. Get out onto the streets. Get into survival mode. Start to get into crime, starting petty crimes, obviously doing stuff just to survive, food over the food, roof over the head, all of that sort of conversation. And that transitions into um, just innovative, very creative crimes, ram raiding as a kid, bank snatches as a teenager, um, high end break and enters into a life of bank robberies. So um, by the end of that, I'd served 18 years of jail. Um, my last sentence, 2010, I served seven years down in Melbourne in maximum security prisons down there, Bowen and so forth. Um, for, for that bank robbery, during that time, I um, uh, bumped into somebody, turned uh, all the little sum of my all efforts, I suppose, over the years into yeah. a life of um, dedicating myself to change and, and a different way of life. At one point in time, shit hits the fan, you just get enough uh, you, I suppose you get to a point where you have enough of your own bullshit. No doubt those that have gone through the drug journey were trying to mask something in the background. I was a young kid who wasn't loved by my parents in my eyes. My yep. father um, was abusive for me to run away from home, so I had the vision that you know he was just a, a, a no good person. Um, what I learned later was that that was his form of discipline and me, him trying to get me to get it more out of life. And I suppose, you know, um, you fast forward to 2010, I've been in the criminal game over 25 years, locked up for 18 of those, 
who was just in and out of prison. Yet I had this huge reputation as a money maker and someone who'd done all these high end sort of um, different types of crime to make a lot of money in a short period of time. I got to um, 210, I just had enough of my own bullshit. And as I said, I did this bachelor's degree and I've stepped out of that and into a new life. And fast forward to 16, brother commits suicide, 218, sister commits suicide, 219, brother dies from a preventable health issue. I lost both parents whilst I was in jail, so I didn't get to say goodbye to them. What I then did was instead of focusing on the problem, as most of us do, we look at the root cause of what was going on. I started to realise what I could change, and that's basically what I did. I unpacked myself um, as human beings. We escapism, as you spoke about before, whether it's drugs, alcohol, I was a womanizer as an example. All these toxic behaviors as a man, um, we high five one another. But you know, that was probably the, um, a quick breakdown of my story and who I am and where I'm from. Interesting. And just to give people an idea that maybe um, haven't come across you as yet uh, on the internet, but I was, uh, so yeah, I'm from Melbourne and I, I, I heard you said the last part of the jail time that you did was, was down here in Melbourne. Um, yeah. But you're, you're from Sydney, right? Where, where are you originally from? Was, is it Redfern? So, yeah, good old Redfern, the block. For those that don't know, I sort of skipped that part. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the block was one of Australia's most notorious streets. To give you context to that, drugs, crime, going to jail, boys home at that time, point in time was a badge of honour for us. There was no fear in going to any of those. Everyone was there. Um, domestic violence, you name it, it was in our community, right? And we just accepted it all as normal behaviours. There was not a problem. And, yeah. For us, when you think and you look back on that, obviously it just came down to the role modelling. That street had its reputation because, you know, police car would drive down, brick would get thrown, they'd jump out, <laughs> the boys would try and jump the police officers who had guns, they'd then burn the police car and, yeah, more police would show up and now running riots uh, ensues from that. And, you know, you'd meet at the top of Redfern, go out and rob a bank, as an example. Like people would go and meet and go to the gym together as young kids or go to walk to school together for us we were catching up at the top of red phone it's insane to even think that and that sort of gives you context so i'll send you some photos that you can use for the podcast and awesome it's just full of graffiti full of the windows were smashed rubbish was everywhere i slept on a foam mattress with 13 other kids and when i say slept on the mattress so whatever bit of it you got by the time <laughs> you got there first in best dressed and um it was yeah for us it was comfort and what we got used to and it was a great place to live um, but when you got people partying to all hours of the morning keeping up all night then you got to go to school there's no food in the fridge on the back end of being one of the most notorious streets in australia violence was king um, so we learned how to fight we learned how to deal with people in a nasty vicious way our the area no taxi drivers would drop you into the area um, people that went to Sydney Uni wouldn't go to Redfern Station and walk to the Uni, even though it was closest probably. They'd all start going to Newtown or Central and they'd walk from that. You know, they'd walk a further distance just to avoid Redfern. It was one of those spaces and places that no one wanted to sort of visit. So um, it's quite it's probably, quite funny because you probably couldn't get a place there for for what like under a under you know the, the, it's all it's all million million plus now in Redfern, isn't it? And it's quite an yeah. app. Affluent sub, sub, suburb, from what I know, anyway. <laughs> Let me give a tip to every single person. I had the money at the time. I was making huge money, as we spoke about. $180,000 for 1,000 square metres back then. <laughs> and it was, like, in a beautiful spot. And I just went, who would buy here? <laughs> so if you ask yourself that question, my advice to you is maybe just buy the property if it's an investment because... 10 years or 15 years down the track, obviously, as you said, reference now, that probably would be worth probably $4 million plus. Subdivide it, you might even get more, right? So um, <laughs> it was a, 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 a dark lesson learned that I hopefully someone takes takes advantage on the other side of this conversation. Yeah, it is crazy and funny. And and look, I'm a bit I'm I'm a bit younger and I think it all happened before my time, but Redfern Redfern's quite famous in the the street that you know, you, you grew up on and all that stuff. Uh, there was like a r riots and stuff like that that eventually occurred down there. Is that is Absolutely. that right? Absolutely. 
you yeah. could you could type that in on YouTube as the example, and you'll see um, some of that footage from the top of Redfern, basically top of Everly Street, Redfern Station runs along there. Um, you've got all the police in these big batons, they've got guns, the whole lot, and you've got kids just throwing you know, <laughs> Molotov cocktails and um, bricks. That was <laughs> that was the uh, weapons of choice, I suppose, back then, versus the police that had these batons, these shields, these guns. Yet you see the kids advancing on the actual police, and that's how twisted and insane that whole area is. You look back on it and you think, but one thing, you know, out of that one lesson, and I try and take every lesson, I t- try and take a lesson out of everything I step into. And one thing I learned from that was you get comfortable with what you know. Yeah, and if you don't 100%. know any better. You know, same thing, if drug use is the space where you go and deal with the past trauma from an experience as an example, that's what you get comfortable with and that's what you accept and what you accept you usually regret. So for me it was just um, – I had to slow it down. I caught slowing it down to speed it up. To do that, I got locked up. It wasn't yeah. by choice. But in, in real time and in real life, my advice to everybody is sit with yourself, grab a journal, write out what's happened in your life, and then what's the best solutions around that, you know, your best perceived solutions around that, and then start to take the steps towards that. And the biggest thing in that journey, a lot of us won't do it because we look back on who we used to be, and, you know, you've got to accept that, Whatever way you want to put it, you're uneducated, you're a fool in that space, whatever it was that I, and I had to go back to the old version and then just rebuild yourself, be willing to do that um, from the experience that may have sent you down a path of addiction to deal or numb yourself in a, in a space or place. Uh, and, and as you know, no doubt talking about it, usually something's behind the action. Uh, and until we slow that down, we won't speed up the transition into the real life that you truly want. Um, we yeah. think that it's, you know, taking drugs or we think that it's from bricks at police cars because that's all we know or that's our only strategy to deal with that emotional stress within our life. And once you actually pause for a moment, write out what you want, you're starting to create a subconscious thought, becomes a conscious action and a different direction is, is you know, able to be started, um, started for yourself on the journey of life. So, and and if I'm being completely honest, like, you know, having sort of like listened to your story, that's that's part of the reason why the stuff that you put out just connects so deeply with me because I know uh, from listening to you, like where you come from and just, you know, knowing myself, having to change from difficult positions, how hard that is. But like what I'm interested in is that, environment that you grew up in and all the stuff that was going on and and how that was normalized and that was just your life and your community uh and then you had a lifetime of that how like how did you actually kind of see a different perspective like i imagine it's pretty hard to um because you don't know what you don't know you know what i mean Absolutely. like yeah like how, how did all that happen how were you able to actually yeah have a different experience and and um think that life could be different for you i suppose you got to hit a pain point right in life and even in addiction i know that obviously being around that in jails and so forth a lot of people whether it was an overdose that happened someone else died in their environment as an example i was i shouldn't say i was very lucky i was in a space where a lot of people died in, very young when I at Redfern, um, heroin had just really come to Australia and it was sort of starting to become a big thing. And these young kids, 13 years of age, all overdosed at that point in time. Yeah. And it just it got me to a position where I just didn't want to be in that space. So I was like, oh, all right, this, to me, it's just so sad that we're able to, you know, we're in this space where, um, a 13 year old kid look back now they're no longer here i think about that just then and that's why i sort of pause you think you know that kid's missed so much life and if we what we have to do instead of waiting to find a pain point where you overdose or you know someone else overdoses in your environment someone dies in your environment maybe it's your parents that have died and wakes you up out of the pattern of behavior that you're currently in for me, as I said, it was that slowing it down to speed it up. And yeah. being in jail, I was in a cell by myself, so my thoughts are going 100 miles an hour now. Here's what happens. You can sit in those thoughts and let it become destructive to yourself, F the world, the place, the 
racism towards Aboriginal people, all of that, right? Or I could say, what could I do to impact positive change towards the life I truly want? To do that, I have to know what my truest life looks like. So I started to write that out. What do you want to get out of life? And when you asked me back then, I would have said, oh, I don't even know. But do you want to drive a particular car? Do you want to have a kid? Do you want to have kids? One kid, two kids, how many kids? Do you want to travel and not have kids at all? So I started to journal it. And yeah. by doing so, I created a framework or roadmap to the life that I wanted. And I didn't, you know, I suppose in the community, you so caught up. I started smoking drugs, marijuana as a kid, because that's what the community did. And I didn't yeah. even get into drugs. And I went, oh, you know, everyone's doing it. I'll get into it as well. And yep. I didn't, yeah, that was probably my, so I got out of it really easy because I only did it to impress people. I got chased by a police officer who was um, quite large at the time <laughs> and I struggled to get away and um, I fit through this little hole in the fence and I looked back and I said, you're not fitting through there, big fella. And he said, when I get you, I'm going to, anyway, long story short, it taught me, I was like, nah, stuff that, if I don't keep myself fit and healthy, I can get caught really easy and I don't want to go to jail and I don't want to be in boys' homes. And then I started to look at that. Why are you doing it then? And I said, if it's for survival, could you make money that allows you to thrive, not survive? And how would that, what would you do? We we're just yep. talking about this with the photographer. That's it. Find something that you're passionate about and then go, you know, pursue that forever. For me, I was into health and fitness. I became a pers- personal trainer. Then in 210, I lied, 203, I come out of Segro and the professor says, you look like, you know, someone that's got their head screwed on. Would you like to do a university degree? I agree to that. And that my whole life shifts at that point in time because now I'm starting to head in the directions of intentions, not distractions. I'm not pleasing the community. I'm not doing it for the money that I need. Apparently, I can be intentional about making money. Why could other people drive Lamborghinis, Ferraris? What were they doing that I wasn't doing? And when you understand that, you go, I'm just bullshitting myself and feeding myself the bullshit excuses that I want to to enable this life that I'm currently living. And then is this life serving you? No, it's not. What what emotions are attached to it? Sadness, anger, yeah, stress and all of the above as an example. And you go, is that what you'd love to live in every single day? No, it's not. So how can you flip that? How can you make money in this space but still be able to not have to please kick your door in, serve some time, be away from your kids? feel shit when the door locks every single night in that cell because you can have the greatest reputation on the streets, which I did, but when that door locked at night, I had to sit with my own emotions. And you can yeah. be tough when the door opens in the morning and say, I'm Jeff Morgan and fuck, I'll serve a thousand years. Wouldn't worry me. I yeah. would do it on my head if I went back today, but do I want to do it on my head? Do I want to go back to jail? So just defining that, that's what I'd say to everyone. Grab a journal. Um, we've got some in general made up for our um, coaching clients, but in general, I just used a notebook. And in this yep. day and age, you can even use your notes within your phone and just write out, define what you want, and then start to take the steps towards. And before you say, oh, I don't know how to do it, if you've written out, I want to become a photographer, you've written out, I want to finish this particular course, well, then you've already taken the first step technically. So if you can take one step, you can take all steps. And that's the biggest thing for everybody that listens to this. Don't beat up on who you used to be. Just tap into who you want to be and be. understand you're, you're going to start at the bottom of some space. But if you never start, you're going to get to a point in your life where you look back and have a lot of regret. So it's such, it, it's such great advice. Like I, I, I um, it, it's really interesting you say that about the journal because I remember when someone first told me that, and I and I have the same experience talking to other people, particularly particularly blokes, you know, probably particularly blokes that sort of come yeah. from a colourful background. You know, you you sort of say like, oh well, if you get out your journal and you start writing out, so they just go, oh, what the fuck? But it's it's amazing that yeah, just by writing something down, the clarity and the focus and the shift that it has in your in your mindset and your I don't know just how you feel about yourself and that goal um and how things can happen and change yeah just just by writing stuff down and then you know once you do that 10 times in a row it it kind of builds and stacks on top of each other and you change them before you know it it's yeah it's 
It's great you advice. So, again, and you, what, you start to realize what turns you talk that didn't leave you from your A to B of life. We were just talking about this too. A is when you're born, B is when you die. Intentions in between. C is a see you later conversation. So if it's a see you later conversation, I just don't waste my time on it. And I've got a way I actually say, I, what I do with that is just say, it's a, to me, I walk past it and I just say, it's not what I want in my life, nor do I, I, I just, it's not my business. That's as, as easy as I can break it down for anyone. I just, and it's, you get good at it. When you first do it, you walk past, something pisses you off, lights your ego up. You know, if someone cuts you off in traffic, what could I, I could go out there and go, mate, pull over at the next corner, I'm going to smash it out, right? But does it really serve me? Do I want to go back into jail? I've got kids out here, grandkids, I've got a partner, a dog. I've got myself, most importantly, and to do that and define my life, that's that person who cut me off is a see later conversation. How do I know that that person isn't rushing to get to a hospital to say goodbye to their loved one for the last time? I don't yeah. even know. Yet I want to fight this person, and it's I just go oh like that. Oh, whatever that person's in a rush, and I'm yeah. Even if they nearly crash into me, I might say fuck. What the fuck are you doing in my head? But I'll get out of that emotion really quickly. I just go oh, whatever. That's not my business. And I get straight out of it. And it's one thing that you can master. And that's your emotional intelligence or IQ and how you respond to a situation. And the greatest response you can have is what someone says to yourself isn't your business. How you respond is the greatest awareness of yourself. And that means that you've defined that A to B. And now every day I live within that. I just, it's other people's business. The wars in this place over in this country or that, it's just not my business. If a land's here and I need to go and start to fight, then it becomes my business. If I want to get into a conversation of the war, then I'm, the only time I'll do that is if I'm going to um, go over to the Ukraine as a representative of Australia and work out a peace, some peace negotiations. So what role is that within the government that I need to work towards? Otherwise, I'm not just going to open my mouth and give an opinion on something and split time that could be utilised towards what I'm passionate about in the life I want towards a, a war that just doesn't involve me. So this is really interesting, and, and this is one thing that strikes me straight away with you when I when I listen to you talk. You know, um, uh, so, yeah, like the experience that I have of you is someone that's really, yeah, you, like gentle, uh, like compassionate, um, you know, like switched on and, and smart and caring. But when you talk about your, um, y yeah, like your past and all the experiences you had, and then even younger growing up in Redfern where there's all the discrimination <laughs> happening, you know, and uh, racism and all that stuff, um, were you always like that? Or, or we like, how were you when you were younger? Were you, were you angry? Were you like, or have you always kind of had this sort of ability to let things go? Or has it been something that you've developed? Oh, I think it was um, proximity to the people I was around. That's what I'd probably say. Yep. My grandmother and mother were very placid people. So they were yep. just chilled. They look for the best in everybody, that sort of thing. And I think, that no, no, I'll rephrase it. That nurturing definitely got built into me, and this is the importance of another lesson: proximity to who you're around. Think about who you're around. What do they bring to the table for you? So, if it's around drug use, you know that it's toxic, right? And you'll say <laughs> that it's positive because you're getting what you want to get at that point in time to get an outcome. But is it really serving you around your mental health? How you feel about yourself? Have you unpacked the past? So. I had the mother side, then I had the father side who was disciplined, German-Austrian, who was coming out of the world wars and very strict and very angry. Obviously, yeah, for me, yeah. those, that abuse went on for four years, physical abuse, um, and made me very tough. And it made me, like, I just, the old David Goggins sort of mentality, literally at 12 years of age, I reckon I had that already. And I was like, well, just stop bullshitting yourself and, don't worry about the labels. Don't worry about that. What's the outcome? What's the solution you want in your life? Stop bullshitting yourself. And I took that. So I had that ability to go from one phrase to one, you know, one level of life, I suppose, to another. Um, but at the same time, when I was younger, I didn't have the emotional IQ to handle that. So once you went to the next level, my solution or strategy to that was violence. 
and I was, for me, I, I would have went to the end. And everyone yep. knew that and had that reputation that this bloke, he won't muck around with you in that sense. But at the same time, I could be less than five minutes later. <laughs> and it was, and so I had, and it was because I hadn't sat with myself and unpacked how I dealt with things, why I dealt with things that way. That's all I learned. And it's so important going back to that whole conversation. Who are you around every single day? Think about the five closest people to you and then do what I call a yin and yang conversation. Yin and yang means black and white, constructive, destructive, positive, negative, happy, sad, whatever, good, bad. And then look at those five people and literally say to yourself, are they really truly serving you towards the life you want around your definition of the A to B? And then, like, obviously in a drug space, for most people, they're going to say, yeah, they are because I'm able to get an outcome. But yeah. is it, are you going to do that when you're 60? Because if that's your way of dealing with something in life, at some point in time, now mental health becomes a part of that invisible backpack. Now your financials are in, in a position. Now your body, you don't feel great about how you look or how you speak, your teeth are missing or whatever it may be, and you can't get it back. And, like, some of those things, some of the, People I've grown up around using drugs, their teeth are gone. They're, you know, unless they're going to go and get veneers, can they afford veneers? No, they can't. So now they've got to carry around these teeth from the drug use, and it's not a judgment. you just got to think about these things and think to yourself, why am I taking that drug or why am I doing taking this action or behaviour or thought that I feed to myself because that's the only strategy I've got. So what could I do? I'll listen to Jack. I'll listen to Jeff. I'll listen to whoever it is. And then start to take the steps towards it. And it's a long – every loss a marathon, it's not going to happen tomorrow. You want to be a millionaire, it won't happen tomorrow. Unless yeah. someone gives you a bunch of millions, you know, past family member that you know how to invest in and re- get a return of investment on the investment, you won't be able to utilise that money well. So be willing to learn. Be willing to be the – I wouldn't say fool in the room, but – the unwisest person in the room, room um, yeah. which is what happened to me. And I, still to this day, still happens. I get into a room full of doctors and professors, so apparently that's the highest standard around health, as an example. But then I'll have a conversation and I feel like, or other people say that was the greatest conversation within that room. So when you believe in yourself, it's because of that definition of your A to B of life. You know what you're talking about. You know how powerful it is. Why are you taking these actions? What's your vision, purpose, and why behind that action? Can you replicate it in a positive way, not a destructive way? So you're taking the drugs to deal with the pain. What about if you exercised, ate well? Have you tried it and seen the feeling? the emotions attached to it, and now, uh, you know, I'd actually feel 10 times better than when I was taking some particular drug to deal with the trauma, and now you've got a different way to life, and more than likely it's going to be around. If you do that around what you're passionate about, I can guarantee you're going to walk away every single day feeling better about um, every single moment that you're living life on your terms. Mate, it's so it's so interesting, and, yeah, by listening to you, it sounds like the, and and it's why we wanted to talk to you, um, because it's the same, it's the same process for you to get out of crime as it is for people to get out of addiction, to get out of any self-destructive behavior. It's this internal journey that you go on, right? Um, to have these different realizations and, and shifts that, that happen and, and, and occur for you. So one of the things that happens for people I find so much is this, um, it, that that come to us for help with addiction is this thing around like identity and their ego that's sort of like attached and wrapped up into their their life and who they are and all that stuff. So, as you said, like um, uh, I, I think I was watching the um, the uh, Spanian podcast. I forget what his podcast is called, but the the interview that search. he did with the search. That's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. the the interview that he did with you, and he was kind of saying, you know, like this this guy is like fucking one of the most notorious guys on mm. on the street and you know like is known as like the money maker i i imagine that sort of shifting and letting go of that identity and changing all this stuff was was challenging like yeah can you just kind of talk us through the process of that and and how hard how hard was that you know to absolutely to let, let go of all that stuff 
That's a good question. Not many ask the identity side of things, but we're all, we get to choose our identity, right? Someone can project something onto us. My dad being physically abusive, some people suffer, suffer some other form of abuse, but if you break it down into a circle, and there's the internal of you, what you control, right? Someone else forces himself onto you, as an example, father belting me, that's an external. So how could I control that? As an example, as a kid, he'd say, be home by 5 o'clock. Well, fuck, I'm going to get home by 4.55. What it did, it made me disciplined in time management, as an example. And to break it down, I looked at that circle and I pressed it. It's almost, I press that button, all things pop out. And it says, you know, you're, you lie to yourself. You're destructive. You're toxic. And you don't beat up on that version. You just go... I have recognition and acknowledgement, and I'm proud of that. So you turn it into a positive because people go, oh, fuck, I'm, you know, taking this shit behavior. I'm, I'm an ex-criminal. I'm a bank robber. No one wants to know me, and no one's going to hire me and so forth. For everybody out there, we work with some of the highest departments in this country and across other countries. We're about to go on a two-month tour of 15 different workshops, teaching wow. leadership to build it to billion-dollar companies, right? As a kid from Bricks, that thing, if you asked me that that's what I was going to do in my life, I'd say, you're fucking dreaming. What are you? <laughs> Stop smoking the drugs, all right? <laughs> get, get off the drugs. But it's it's the definition of your identity. So I looked at that. When I was in jail, and I was saying, fuck, the reputation, like taking you back to Spanion's podcast is a great, I use it all the time in the sense of the first thing he said, hood superstar, right? <laughs> Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, hood superstar. Yeah, people can define this, and I'm cool with this, right? <laughs> I've learned to live with this because people write, ah, fuck you and a hood superstar making the money that we made from the last bank robbery, 250K, four people. We served seven years. We worked it out the other day. This mathematician was there working it out in this workshop. It was, it was ridiculous. It was nothing. The money that I would have made over that seven years, well, I could have made that off the dog. Well, so, that's what I, that's what I was going to ask you as well. Yeah, yeah. You go you go through that process. So this is that slowing it down to speed it up. So when I'm in a space now, even around these billion dollar organisations, how how much time am I going to spend in there? How much value do I give to that space? So I started to look at shit and go, oh, fuck. Not only am I making minimal money, I'm stressed out. I'm locked up. I'm away from my kids. Like I broke it down and look at it. And instead of going, what a shit cunt you are to yourself, you know, to you, to your kids, your community, and all that. What was the positives I could take away from it? All right, I was resilient, I was strong, and if I could take all those qualities, because if we're on drugs, especially, usually your self esteem's at its lowest, right? You just yep. you don't feel good. But I'll even tell, yeah, and I asked someone this today. We were in this same sort of scenario and workshop. I said, "Are you committed to get those drugs every single day?" And the person said, "Hundred percent." I said, "So you got commitment, perseverance." So. Our resume of life, if I said, right, what's your resume? Someone goes, oh, fuck, I've done no courses. That's the first thing they'll say to me. And I go, no one fucking asks you about your courses. What <laughs> have you done in life that is a quality that you could take into a constructive life from the destructive yin and yang, remember? So when you do that, now you're starting to go, actually, I've got fucking great qualities. How many people in business go and ask them, hey, at the highest level, we deal with them, have worked for 24 hours. If there's closing a major deal, they'll go hard. They might even go for days, right? But in general, a small, I'd say 5%, if that, 3% of the world operate at that level. How many times has a drug user gone 24 hours trying to get themselves to a point? That's a high quality that you can take into business. If you can rock and roll for 24 hours without sleep to make sure you get an outcome, you are a fucking one determined motherfucker, right? So if you can do that, then replicate it in a positive space around the business of your or the thing that you're passionate about. You go and train for 24 hours because you want to play in some professional sporting team in the world, and you do that. I wouldn't advise training for 24 hours, but if you could – you break it down and say, I need to train morning and night. Fuck, that's easy money. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, what, how long for? Two hours each time. No problems. Done 24 hours where I didn't stop. And now yep. you can perceive things differently. But what we'll perceive ourselves, oh, I'm just a drug user with no skills. I don't have any courses. I, I've never done that. 
And that's how we can then start to shift from one space into another space with um, more clarity around a better direction of your vision, purpose and why of who you actually are. And you build that identity that you spoke about and you just be comfortable one habit at a time, man. And because if you've got that one habit around drug use, well, you can change me that you can commit to one habit. It's just yeah. a matter of now choosing a different type of a habit. And if that's just even what you tell yourself when you wake up, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm shit. I don't ever amount to anything. Maybe tomorrow your one habit is to just say, I'm going to fucking crush life. And if yeah. you keep telling yourself that, guess what you do? Like, you know what? What would that look like? Oh, I'm going to walk around the block every day or something. <laughs> Probably walking fucking miles to get your drugs, right? So what's the difference? Now I'm just going to do it in a constructive way. I'm not going to go and see the dealer. I'm actually going to go and just do it for myself. And now it becomes a different conversation. And your identity, you start. Uh, it's like you've got a foundation. I choose to draw a line in the sand. That's your foundation. Now I'm walking around the block. Now I'm telling myself. And all of a sudden you're working through these different levels of the apartment block until you're in a penthouse and your thoughts, behaviours, beliefs and actions start to replicate the truest identity of who you want to be and the feelings and emotions attached to that will be the same that you got out of the drug use more than likely but 10 times um, better without the, the the withdrawals or the aftermath or the stress or trying to get it the second time around. Mate, you're spot on. You just you, you have so much knowledge in all of this stuff. It, it's amazing. Like the things that you're saying, um, <laughs> you know, I've paid people a lot of money <laughs> to kind of try and work out that stuff and be and be told that stuff. It's 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 awesome. And the same thing happened to me, right? Like I so uh, you know, I, I don't I don't say this out of a egotistical way. It's just it's just the truth. Like so. One of the skills that I have is um, is that yeah I just I just sort of it's a bit of just like a natural thing, uh, but it, it, I just I tend to intuitively like sort of know like how people are feeling or like what's going on for people, and I'm able to like help guide them through that process when they don't even know what's going on, and I just nat I just naturally can like I don't know how I do it I just pick up on different things right but I was like working through some stuff with the guy once. Um, and and we sort of worked out that because I'm the opposite to you. I, I I wasn't. I'm I'm massive. I'm a big gentle teddy bear. I'm I'm six six. Mm. But I'll I'll give you I, like I'll give you a hug before I punch you in the guts. You know I got I don't really have any fight, fighting bones in my body. But when I was using drugs, you know you're just in that crazy environment with crazy people. And and I remember just being fucking on edge all the time and, and and learning, like going into rooms and just like learning cues and, and um, you know, signs and signals from like different people when different shit was going to go down or they had a Absolutely. problem or whatever. And yeah. that has actually fed into like a skill now that I have, I believe, as like a counsellor where I'm just able to understand people and just be hyper aware to different things and it came largely from yeah my experience in addiction and just being in you know difficult situations have you found the same thing for yourself like you know i think you mentioned it before like resilience and and you know work ethic and just being able to put up with you know all types of uh challenging um situations in in environments i imagine that's being able to pour rocket fuel on like the success that you've had um, in the stuff you're doing now. Yeah, and you think about jail, jail's like times 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> so you better, you better get good at reading the environment because if not, you might get someone hit you from the side that you don't expect or it could, be, it could even be worse, could be something even worse. So you pick up on it, you get a... Uh, and we all have that innate sort of um, skill as fight or flight in our fight or flight system. You're standing, even ATMs, and someone comes and stands too close to you, like, who's this next to you? That's just what you pick up as a skill. And going back to that proximity or who you're around can teach you other skills that allow you to then step into a space. But you can teach yourself so much where you don't need a PhD or a degree or a certificate to be good at something. And as you said, that you know, no doubt helps you and your counselling side of things. Help me in jail, but obviously now in a business corporate world, people go, what did you learn from jail? You couldn't, there's nothing in there. There's so many lessons <laughs> around resilience. If I, corporates love to know how under huge stress, 
they can still operate at a level where they don't just accept the stress, but they actually manage it really well. And they use that and harness it as that rocket fuel, like you said, towards the direction that they want to be heading. And when you do that day in, day out, and that becomes your normal habit and ritual, you you get to choose your habits and rituals. We all do like the habits of the destruction block from the past and how you're not willing to unpack that invisible backpack or the habit of, fuck, who am I and what identity do I want to live in? That's a different conversation. I, I want everybody that goes through this podcast to think to yourself, what are the habits that I have? And I'm not talking about the drug side of things. I want you to think about around elements of your life, right? Yeah academic or educational habits, your financial habits. like, And then what you can do is relationship habits. Do you have boundaries, values, morals, beliefs, all that is, and attached to all that is respect, right? What about your health? What are you doing around your health habits? Do you believe in yourself? Do you, and what health in general, people go, oh, so how much am I training or am I eating well? I always say to people, what you, what are you feeding yourself? And they go, oh, I'm feeding, I, I eat. Eggs, right? And I'm like, no, I'm talking about your thoughts, your actions, your behaviors, your beliefs, your environments. Break it all down. So all that and what I spoke about with the journaling before, and you're so true about the men, they're like, no, nah, fuck, I don't need that, Morgs. <laughs> Until they do it and they go, fuck, you know what, it was the best thing I ever did. Because we do go through life where men are, <laughs> I always define it as, you know, ooga booga caveman, I just bump, bump someone over the head, some food and I'll eat, and that's about it, right? That's how we operate in this world. And the world's become so complex. And if you don't define who you want to be, you just sort of, like, this will be your life. You'll go here, there, everywhere. Every now and again, you have good times when you're bendering over here. But even then, you think it's great bendering over here. But what you're doing is finding, you know, someone says I'm sweet to me all the time. And then next minute, they're saying, Morgs, can I borrow 50 bucks during the week? And I'm like, oh, fuck, if he's borrowing 50 bucks off me, did he pay his rent? Does he have food? What about fuel to get his car to work? All that, like, that's not going to help you survive during the week. So understanding total clarity comes from writing that shit out, seeing it right in front of yourself, and then being able to use what you've gained from the experiences of life. We've all gained lessons that we can all learn from one another. My grandmother taught me listen and learn. Probably could have done that um, 18 years prior to 18 years in jail. But in <laughs> general, um, when it clicked in and I had – what happened? She had huge influence when I was young and it broke off. And I believe if she stayed there for another five years, I don't think I would have went down the path I went down. Because yeah. I, I was going to school on days I didn't really want to. And what it did, it created discipline. And I look back on it and said, fuck, you got discipline in you. You got commitment in you. You got perseverance. So I looked at all the positives. Just be sure to um, break yourself down and don't break yourself down into the negatives. No. I come in, hey, fuck out, how are you, brother? My name is Jeff. I'm full of toxic behaviour, stress, heartache, anger, pain. No one wants to hang around me. So why do we want to go and say, fuck, this is how I'm built? All I want you to think about is what are the lessons from that experience to build you as that individual so it builds your identity into who you truly want to be? A hundred percent. And everything that you just said for everyone listening, the crux of like turning, you know, your addiction around a lot of people talk about like trauma and all that, and, and it is part of it. But, you know, I, I've found that that's sort of the secret sauce is if you, if you believe uh, different things about yourself and the rest of the world, you, you typically get different outcomes um, <laughs> in, in your life. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to ask you about. You brought it up before about, you know, there was four of you and you got 250K, I think you said, or 200 or something and you did mm. seven years and you broke it down and it was it works out to kind of be like fuck all. I guess a lot, <laughs> a lot of people um, that, yeah, listen to this podcast, use drugs, are involved in that world, are obviously also involved in crime in, in some way. Um, and, uh, yeah, like... It's probably the wrong question to ask um, or the wrong way to frame it, but all the stuff that you did, even though you were known as like a, yeah, a, a top earner, like, would you say that it was worth it, um, you know, for all, for the 18 years yeah. prison that you did? Who wants all that stress? Who wants all those years? I wouldn't say they're wasted because I turned them into a lesson. But yeah. if I could say 
would you like 18 years in what you do now? Fuck, I'd flip it in a heartbeat. And there's a beautiful saying, you can be at war with yourself and peace with the world, or you can be at peace with yourself and war with the world. And what that means is you just don't give a fuck about what anyone else thinks but yourself around who you want to be. As long as it's, I'm not coming into Jack's life and saying, fuck you, Jack, and disrupting you know, come and smash his house up, then I'm disrespecting him. And more importantly, then I don't value myself as well. So once I got in that space where I was at peace with myself, you're not going to please everybody and everybody's going to, you know, oh, that person's up himself, he's doing it for himself. Imagine we all just did that and we lived our greatest life around ourselves. We wouldn't have war. We wouldn't have time. I don't have time to worry. Oh, fuck, Jack, what are you doing? can't believe you're wearing that fucking beanie, brother. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's not my business. I just don't, uh, as I said at the start. And that's, you know, use that little saying for yourself. What does peace for you look like? And then when you, what's the intentions behind all of those actions? And then you'll just step out. You won't get in. You, you just, I don't get involved in conversations of convenience to throw an opinion out to the world. I'm too busy in my intentions of my A to B just to worry about me. And people say, oh, you're selfish or whatever it else. You know, um, there's no way that I'd ever step back into that life. And it is about, as you said, you'll never be what you can't see. And that means that you have to consciously say, what do I want to be, even if it's fucking uh, – Air Force pilot or it's fly to the moon, right? As, as much as it might seem like a dream, that kid throwing a brick at Redfern, when the government first dropped money into my account, I was like, this is fucking trippy. Or coppers are reaching out going, hey, Jeff, can I talk to you about my mental health? I'm like, what the f- actually? <laughs> but if you're that skilled at what you do, and I don't know what it is that people do, I just use the skills. And I, to be honest with you, as much as I've got the degree and certificates as a mentor of first data, personal what, what's, training, what's, what's, your deg- what's your degree in? Nutrition science. Nutrition, yeah, yeah, wow. Is that if I, in general, I'm in a space then where I literally, um, I think I've learned more through interactions with people than I have through that degree. So yeah. don't get caught up thinking, oh, I don't have a fucking degree. I don't have this certificate. I'm not qualified in this. Life qualifies you to um, step into a space and say, here's what I did and that's what I did. I broke myself down and now I can give that same advice. And as human beings, how could I'm operating at a really high level for myself to get out what I want out of life. But the, if I look at it, um, some football player, oh, fuck, I wish I could play footy, wish I could drive that car or wish I could travel to that location. If it's not part of my A to B, I just don't even give a fuck. And it's it's not because I'm ignorant, ignorant or arrogant. It's just that uh, no one's saying when you drive a car, you don't. I don't drive up next to Jack and say, Jack, can you grab the steering wheel? You're driving your own car for your own fucking life. So let go of other people's steering wheels or you trying to control your steering wheel in a sense where, um, or, or you know, sharing that steer, steering wheel with other people in general. My biggest advice to yourself is to only do yourself around your A to B. Clearly define who you want to be. That means you rebuild your identity. Think of yourself like a block of flats. You're just building a foundation, one habit at a time towards that direction. And, man, it's just a, a better way to life, I promise you, man. And be committed. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very cool, mate. Like, And that, that was what I was going to say to you before um, or ask you about because, yeah, you – like, I, I don't know if you formally kind of call it that, but you've got that very like stoic sort of um, philosophy, which is, you know, which I think is a really, um, it, it's probably, you know, a lot of people acknowledge that it's one of the best ways to, to live for, yeah, peace and contentment and happiness. Um, but I find it interesting because like you, I've found myself in spaces with like government, you know, like advocating for like policy change, stuff like that. And I guess when you get in those um, environments, there's people in there, they're trying to do good stuff, but they're fucking, they're, they're angry. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they can like, yeah. they can just like kind of go a bit like crazy. It's for a good cause, but they just, the way that they sort of put the message out um, just falls on, on deaf ears. And that's what I find interesting about you. There's, there's probably, 
if we were to put it on paper, there, there's probably a lot of things that you could be really upset and angry about and Easy. and and um, easily take the um, the vic the victim um, status around, um, but you don't, you know. Um, uh, yeah. You focus on the problem, you always find pain. You focus on the solution, you always find happiness. Who wants to find pain? Anyone in this podcast, right? Ask yourself that question. So it's that simple. I'll go, fuck, I, I just don't, I don't. So if I say to Jack, hey, fuck, today's been shit. This photographer's doing my head in as an example. Then you're going to get into a different space. So I've got some calls coming in where your focus is purely on blaming the, the photographer for your sh shit day, but the shit day really comes down to you taking uh, or not having any clarity around what you want out of life. And then you get in a spot where, you know, all of a sudden you're not making the money that you want to. So you can't go on holidays that everyone else sees. And now it's the photographer's, the photographer's fault because they distracted you from, you know, something that you were apparently going to do and you haven't done for 10 years. It's just all toxic enabling behavior. Every environment you step into is about teeing off. So it's like a golf tee. You put the ball on top, time, energy, and effort. How much time, energy, and effort do I want to give to this? Define who you are. And as I said, going back to those that are on the drug use path, right, or the toxic path, just as I was, um, break it down to the yin and yang. Is it really, truly what you want out of your life? What are you doing it for? And once you write that out, you take a subconscious thought and you start to see the conscious actions. And by doing that little process, you start to look at it and go, fuck, what, what will happen is you go, fuck, I don't feel, I feel even worse now. Because yeah. now I see how my, my actions aren't serving me. That's the nice way of putting it. And then you can start to say, well, I'm cool with that. Acknowledgement. I'm blessed to be alive and get another opportunity in life. I woke up this morning. And what I'm going to do is try to start to shift to, towards a better life, the one that I want. And what will happen, you'll try it, just like everyone with their weight loss journey, January 1st, January 10th, they fall over because they don't have the skill set, the knowledge, the education, the information to do what they need to do or the discipline, most importantly, behind it. My advice to yourself is get comfortable with saying, I'm going to just keep showing up until this becomes a part of my DNA. And now my discipline, my actions, my accountability, my responsibility, ownership towards the life I want is in play. And I, I'm not going to be as good as Jack or as fast as he's on his journey or Jeff. But in the end, it doesn't matter because it's only you v you creating one habit at a time towards the life you want. And you get comfortable with that. Now you're on a, a better journey towards the emotions and feelings that you want within your life. You don't get comfortable with that. You sit in comparison and you always say, fuck, I'm not as good as that person. I'll never worry about being as good as anybody and I never have. And that comes back to what the 12-year-old kid that gets thrown out on the streets and the only thing you fucking care about is yourself and making sure that you're right at that time. And what we do in the drug scenario, we take a drug, we drink alcohol, we womanize, we do whatever toxic babies you got because we think that's fixing the problem but really we're just stepping away from what's heavy in the invisible backpack my advice step back into it unpack it one habit at a time i'm going to unpack this what did i feel from it what can i replace that with so the negative into a positive or the good into a bad uh bad into a good sorry <laughs> good into a bad and then you start to step into a different way of life and until we do that We'll always just sit in, this is how I deal with things. I'm right. I don't care now. Drugs are fixing me. And then you'll get to a point in life you say, well, I'm so fucked up by it, so twisted by it, I just don't even care anymore. And once you get to that position, now it's a dangerous one because your actions will match the reactions of your thoughts. And that usually means that you'll just be toxic. you have no boundaries. you do shit things and you'll feel all of the above. So. Um, pause for a moment, slow it down, speed it up, and watch your life shift, man. I, I promise you, it might not happen straight away, but it will happen. Yeah, I'd love to man. say pantene right now, but <laughs> the, the old pantene won't happen overnight, but it will happen. But <laughs> I just don't have any hair. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> oh. 
Um, I love it. Hey, everybody listening and, and watching, uh, for what it's worth, um, all the stuff that Jeff's saying on this podcast is fucking spot on. Um, and, and it really is the, the golden nuggets and applied it will help you to change your life. So you mentioned mm-hmm. that you do, that you do, um, uh, you know, stuff with corporates and, and big companies and, and things like that. Do you also do, uh, things for, um, you know, like direct to consumer, like individuals? Um, yeah. Do you have, do you have programs and stuff that people can check out and look at if they want to? Absolutely. So you got two versions. You got the cut the bullshit program, which is a group setting. You can jump in there. Um, it's a safe space. We're all about safety, security, and stability. The biggest thing I'd say to everybody, if you are in the group, you can unload that invisible backpack. You'll get the support, not only from me, but the group, because whether they're corporate or not, they're all realized and I'll have the realization and acknowledgement of who I am currently am and that doesn't serve me but who how can i build those foundations i spoke about versus the elite mindset coaching where it's a one-on-one process we really deep dive on how you're built look at it what are the emotions touch shit you know what this isn't what i want and then you shift out of it into a different you know version of yourself and um then we've got the corporate side of things if you're in the rehab we come out to rehabs we do we can do the singular talks. We go out, we do long-term programs, three to five-year programs with communities, organisations, health services, um, and that, you know, that's basically what we've done with those lessons of life. I've unpacked them. I've turned, it in, turned my passion, um, the lessons into passion, and, and life's magical at the moment. That's awesome, man. Where where can people find you? Where are you most prominent on sort of Instagram or, or TikTok? Yeah, or? probably that's a platform I started off using a long time ago. And but in general, we've made a little promise to ourselves. YouTube, TikTok's been big this year. TikTok's massive as a business opportunity. But JeffreyMorgan.com. dot com. dot au. Drop us a thing there. You can jump on the Instagram, go into the coaching section. If you want one-on-one coaching, there is an application form there. The reason why we do that, we just make sure that if I'm not the person that deals with yourself in that space, we've got a good um, solid team. All those people have been through a journey themselves. We've got people that are athletes, ex-soldiers, SA soldiers, as in, yeah, and it just depends on what you've obviously dropped in there and what we want to get out of yourself. You will interact with me at some point in time. Um, but by all means, yeah, just do it for yourself and don't think that, you know, if you can do one thing, you can do everything. And if the one thing is to chase drugs every single day, well, that means that you can do fucking something else in the same way every single day as well. And if that's a, yeah, if that was to minimize the stress, bring you in a peace and peace of mind, how much is that worth to yourself? Write that out. And when you see that, then you start to take actions around what you've written out because that's important to you. Awesome, mate. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for coming on. Everybody go and uh, give him a follow. All those details will be in the show description and notes um, wherever you want to find it because I've made a promise to ourselves as well that we're going to try and kick up the YouTube and all the platforms and shit as well. Um, So wherever you guys consume it, it'll be there. but thanks again, mate. Really appreciate it. Um, and it was a kick for me as well to, you know, chat to someone that I actually follow myself. So <laughs> Thank that's, you. I love that's it. awesome, mate. Mate, awesome. your mentality creates a better reality and it starts with the day that you decide to pull yourself up on the bullshit that you tell yourself. The ownership, accountability and responsibility to the words that come out of your mouth create the integrity behind the actions that you take towards the life that you want. Don't wait for somebody else to create it. The longer you wait for someone else to do that, the more you're going to sit within the strategies that you know. And if that's toxic behaviours, the only one that's going to change that is you when you face up to you and unpack that invisible backpack one habit at a time. So um, you know, if you need, you, even if you've got a question, just reach out to me on socials, hit me up and we'll have a conversation. But best wishes to every single person out there. Much love. And if I can do it, then you can do it too. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Um, Have a great day, dude, and peace, everybody.